Julie, you have 33 producing credits. Which of the films, or film in particular, are you most proud of? Hmm. Well, I think I'm, in a way, proudest of a series of films that, um, that I executive produced that came out of 9-11 when I was the chair of the graduate film department at NYU. And uh, it was a very scary moment for me because I had actually never taught before and I taught, when I was the chair of the graduate film department at NYU, I taught a class in producing. And the first day of the first class, I said, you all need to get your database, your address book, whatever it is, get the names of everybody in this class and keep adding the whole time you're here because you need people to make films and you never know what you're going to need or when you're going to need it. But it's very important to have a lot of people you can contact. So that was the first thing I said. And the second thing I said was, there's really only one question a producer needs to be asking all the time. And that question is, why aren't we shooting? And between the first class and the second class, 9-11 occurred. Why we weren't shooting is that Giuliani shut down film production everywhere in the five boroughs. So that was a problem, and I was really stymied for the first time as a producer. I don't know how to get these students to shoot when it's forbidden. So I came back to LA on the weekend, and I thought about my database, and I called Jerry Offsay, at, um, who was at Showtime then, and I said, Jerry, I asked my students at NYU to give me one visual about something that affected them in 9-11, and I'd like to show you my pictures. And he looked at them and he said, how about $100,000 for 10 student films to air next year on 9-11? And I think that was a very high moment for me. Wow, okay, I didn't, I didn't know the full background of that. And then the films did air a year they on did. the anniversary? Uh -huh. Okay. Do you still keep in touch with any of those filmmakers? I hear from them all the time. Will you read my script? Do you know where I can get financing for this? Um, uh, you know, and some of them have kind of gone into other walks of life and they still stay in touch. And uh, one is teaching, and a couple of them are teaching at other film schools. Uh, and one of them actually, who was, um, uh, you know, a teaching assistant of mine when I was at NYU, uh, was Chinese American. And we just shot a film last year in Guangzhou, and she went over to um, run production for us. So that was a very nice moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the students was a Chinese who um, had a background in medicine and I knew of a doctor who had been a um, who was very familiar with a program in China in which Khrushchev had said to doctors in China I want you to put together the best of Eastern and the best of Western medicine so that in the Soviet Union we will have the best of the best and this doctor knew about all of these doctors who had worked on that project and they were getting on in years and he wanted to document it so this um, student went over and did the documentary film for him. Oh. So the first day of class um, happened and then do you remember when you heard the news about the, the towers? Oh yes, well my son called and said this terrible thing is happening you know right in the zone. This was, you know, NYU was very near to where the towers were and where they fell. And it was early in the morning and then we knew and everybody was reacting how in, you know, in unexpected ways because some people who I thought would be very um, kind of tower of strength through it fell apart and, and others the reverse. And I remember I had one um, student who, who had been in Yugoslavia you know, during war-torn years. And the first thing he did was grab pails and go for water. So everybody had a different way of coming at it. Yeah, I've heard that before, that people that seem maybe slightly off in some sense actually fare better during a crisis than those that seem like they would handle it more. So then after Giuliani reopened the city, or, you know, it's been some time now, I don't remember the exact turn of events, Mm -hmm. How soon were you back in the class again? 
Oh, well, the classes, the class went on. Oh, we did? Uh, yes, okay. and in a very short time, we got an answer from Showtime. I was thinking, I know the legal department at Showtime. I know the legal department at NYU. There's, this is going to take a long time. But in a matter of a couple of weeks, everything was done. Everything was sealed, and the students went forward with their, you know, coming up with their projects, and then Showtime selected from those that were submitted. And uh, we went forward, and they mm. got them made, and you know, it was very heartening. Do you recommend film school for every aspiring filmmaker? What if someone can't afford it or is not able to get a scholarship? No, not necessarily. I think it's uh, I, I think it's a way to get your films made inexpensively, and to be in an environment and with students who are like-minded. In, in certain ways, who have um, who share with you, you know, your time uh, in the universe, and uh, who can be very helpful to you because they they have a perspective on what you're trying to do as an artist that actually no one else has because of that. So even the even the professors or even you know filmmakers who are well established or famous. Uh, who come to talk to the students, they're still talking from a slightly different place or even a tremendously different place than the peer group. So I think there's a great deal that, that can be gotten from that in, you know, in a short, fairly short amount of time. And also the different film schools uh, have different ways of specializing in how they teach film. So one of the strengths of NYU, which is clearly the one I know the best, is that everyone works on everybody else's film, everybody makes films. And it means at the end of that period of time, you know so much about production that I think when you get out in the real world, nobody can pull the wool over your eyes as to what's going on in production. And the same advice that you gave to those students in terms of keeping a database of everyone in the class, do you recommend that to people that are fresh off the bus to Los Angeles as well? Oh, absolutely. You just never know when, you know, somebody will become important. I mean, look at the Chinese American girl who happened to have a background in medicine or, or in science, who then went to do this documentary in China, which was a kind of extraordinary uh, putting together um, uh, of two people who had a common interest they wouldn't have known about if I didn't have the database. Where does film producing begin for you? How do you start off every project? I know you touched briefly on uh -huh. the financing, of course. Well, I think every every project comes up in a slightly different way. So it can be that someone walks in with the money, which happened a couple of times, uh, and the project. Or it can be that I have an idea. Or it can be that there's a book that inspires, or that there is someone who is particularly passionate about a project and comes to me and you know wants to be involved and we, we work on it jointly. So I think all different. Let's suppose the money's there, good thing, you have the script, you, you know who you're going to have as the director. Um, what are the things that you start doing? You mm -hmm. have casting, well, what, what's your day like, first day sort of on the job, so to speak? How do you start organizing um, your own sort of uh -huh. checklist? Well, assuming there's distribution and a distribution date, then I work backward from there. How long do we have to do the post-production? Okay. How long do we have then for the shoot? How long do we have for pre-production? And I like to get as much pre-production time as, absolutely as much pre-production time as possible because it's uh, time and money well spent because it's not a crew standing around and a cast standing around while you're trying to figure out what to do. So the more, the more that you can, um, you know, be prepared in pre-production, the easier the shoot, in general, goes. And then you can address yourself to the inevitable problems that come up during production. Um, so I would say the first thing that I do once I have those things in hand, the script, the money, uh, the director, I would hope that I would have distribution and know the distribution date. Uh, and then I would start with three, maybe four files, cast, crew, locations, and 
legal <laughs> and and begin to put things together with a list. Now, the first thing I ever did in film was scout locations. So I have also got an idea for a film by visiting a location and saying to myself, I have to shoot here. And then I go looking for a script or I go looking for a book. And then that's how I get it made and I go back and shoot there. One of the places I've been to and haven't shot is Anchor Wat, and it, it's kind of on my mind a lot. So I'm always looking for a book or a script that would work well to shoot at Anchor Wat. Um, but other places I've been and said, oh, I have to come back, is Machu Picchu uh, in Peru, and uh, I've shot all up and down the Nile in Egypt. So it excites me to go to great locations and shoot there. What is it about a certain location, aside from maybe the physical beauty of it? Do you almost feel that there's some sense of, I don't, I don't know, is there some other sense that you pick up from going to a certain location? Or it's just... Well, um, I, I think it's a way of getting to know a place, and maybe because I grew up in the Midwest and kind of, you know, circumscribed by the Mississippi and Missouri rivers and since St. Louis, um, you know, going to exotic places was something I kind of dreamed about but never really thought it could happen. And so maybe this is kind of an extension of childhood dreams. But the unintended consequence of shooting in these places that have um, locations that have really thrilled me is it's a way of getting to know the people, the culture, by being part of it. However, you know, remote I am because I'm not from that region, uh, there is something that I know which is how to make a film. And there's something I don't know, which is how do they make films in that country or in that region? And for example, um, I worked with a Peruvian, Lucho Yosa, and made a film there called Max is Missing. And what I saw with his crew, who were not terribly experienced for the most part, is that they functioned like a family everybody supporting everybody else. Nobody saying that's your job if something had to be done. And there was a kind of respect they had for Lucho as the sort of father figure, which is, I think, maybe common, or maybe this is my conjecture, in Latin American countries. Uh, and the combination of <clears throat> the respect they had for Lucho. Not that he was giving orders, but they, that they wanted to do well for him and the way that they worked as if they were kind of brothers, sisters, cousins to provide what needed to be provided for the film was, was quite lovely. Do you think that exists in American cinema? With American sets? I think it can, I think it can exist probably more, more likely. Uh, with a director everyone is like desperately wanting to work with because they respect his or her work or in more likely an independent film where everybody's so excited to just get to the end of the day of shooting and it's something that they hope will shoot them to the top in the industry. But even if not, it's something they really, really wanted to do. So in that sense, this kind of camaraderie I have seen happen in, in independent um, feature films. What is it about a director that gives them sort of the personable feel of, of a father-like figure because you know we've heard of great people great artists that there is sort mm -hmm. of a wall that's put up and maybe it's by necessity you know I'm, I'm sure it's got to mm -hmm. be difficult to always have people trying to access you all the time and need something from you but then there's those that seem to know how to just make each person that they're speaking to feel special have you sort of seen some of the traits or Yes, I've seen all of the above. You know, I've, I've seen directors in, on my films who uh, get the crew very committed to them. I've seen directors who are very precise in what they do, and it's, it's comforting to me as a producer that the director has sketched all the shots, has laid it out so everybody knows what they're doing. Um, I've seen, you know, scared directors. Uh, so just, yeah. It, it's hard to say what would make uh, this kind of camaraderie happen or not happen. Sure. And when you are when you do see this location that's just amazing and it just all sorts of ideas come to you, are there certain things that 
you say, you know what, this is a no-go, aside from maybe obvious sound um, issues. But are there certain things, like, do you have a checklist, like, okay, this is a very beautiful locale mm -hmm. I want to shoot here, but this is not going to work, or this looks right? Well, expense, or weather, or, yeah, there are a lot of things to take into consideration as to whether it would be possible to shoot at the location or not, and whether it's worth it to take the gamble of whether you can pull it off, whether you'll actually get the government uh, sign off, or whether you'll actually, um, you know, be able to get the tourist to stand aside, or, well, you know, whatever. Oh, in one case, I remember there was a location where they said, well, this is a nature preserve, and you're welcome to shoot here, except that we have a certain kind of a very rare crane that is nesting. And if, <laughs> if the you know, if there's no more need for the nest, in other words, if the, you know, if the baby is born and the crane flies away from the nest, you can shoot there and otherwise, no. So. So did you have someone on the set designated as a, a nest checker or how did, how did you work? No, I think it, it just worked out. It did. It yeah, out. it did. Yeah. Julie, every young artist dreams of creating a ripple and, and you know now with the internet with Twitter and, and things can just be sort of instantaneous all over the world at a push of a button do you remember the first time that you said I want to create a ripple in the world I want to do something that affects people whether I'm known for it or not but I just want to be part of something well the first thing that comes to my mind is not not exactly what you're asking but is that um, I lived in LA in the, when the smog was very, very bad. And I would get up every morning and listen to the radio station and they would come on and the announcer would be what I call selling the weather and say, and in Los Angeles today, there is no smog. And I'd be like, oh my God. So I tried to figure out how to address that in film. And I didn't do very well um, doing it in a, in a kind of, um, you know, head-on way. So I finally was able to do it with humor. Uh, and I had, it was a, you know, just kind of straight exploitation picture about called, um, I think it was summer school teachers. And uh, and so they, this girl gets up in the morning and she raises the window and looks out at the smog and coughs. And the radio announcer comes on and says, in Los Angeles today, there is no smog. And it always got a laugh, but I thought maybe somebody thought about it afterward. Um, I didn't give up. I'm very persistent, which I think you have to be as a producer. And I decided that I was going to track down who was allowing the radio stations to say there's no smog in LA today when clearly, um, oh, I forgot. <laughs> After he says there's no smog today, the girl la uh, coughs. So she raises the window, sees the smog, the radio announcer comes on and says, in Los Angeles today there is no smog, and she coughs. So I tracked down for, through the radio station. I started by calling them and saying, why are you saying there's no smog? And they said, well, because the, I think it was the, called the Air Quality Management District in those days, um, has levels uh, below which they say it's not smog. And I said, levels for what? And they said, well, they only measure four things. So it turned out there were some things that were very carcinogenic that might be at very high levels, but they would still be within the rights to say no smog because it didn't appear on the list of what was being monitored by the AQMD. Then I went to the state uh, and, and reached um, the head of the Air Quality Management District and took him to breakfast and said, this should not be allowed to happen, and you know it. And then Jerry Brown appointed me to, <laughs> to the Air Resources Board. Anyway, it's a much longer story. But yes, I thought, in, in kind of my naivete, but on the other hand, eventually people did make a difference, so I wasn't the only one who was going that route and trying to think about it. Whereas before that, I think there had been a different attitude about smog, which I discovered when my mother told me she thought it was crazy.
to, to try to do anything about smog. I, of course, thought she was crazy to even suggest that I shouldn't try to do something about smog. And finally, I said to her one day, when she made the comment as we were driving into Los Angeles, I get so excited when I smell the smog. I said, Mother, why? And she said, because it means jobs. So my mother had lived through the Depression. So she looked at smoke a completely different way than I did. Eventually, she came to see things my way. Interesting. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people with old cars that have really fought the California smog laws because it's, it's so hard to get an older car smogged and to, uh, to have it passed. Anyway, they stopped announcing no smog today. They stopped that. So at least <laughs> accomplished that. And, and so what would you tell a, a young person that wants to create a ripple and whether it's something creative or to, you know, better the air quality? Well, I think what I see and think about for my children and what I think about, you know, looking back on my time of, you know, being young, like in my 20s and my 30s, is that I could have done more, but I didn't know that I could. So I think it's that. I think you can do more than you think you can. That's what I would, would like to say in, in these areas of, that you're passionate about. The film is Boxcar Bertha, and the way it came about is that my husband had made a film called Bloody Mama with Shelley Winters and Bobby De Niro, and, um, and he made it for AIP, and they wanted another woman gangster. And I love to do research. I just love to do research. So Roger said he was looking for a woman gangster, <clears throat> and I tried finding information about women gangsters and other than the you know the most notorious like Bonnie and Clyde Ma Barker I really couldn't find much and I called a friend of mine who worked um, in the DA's office and I said got any interesting things on women gangsters why can't I find anything and um, I was uh, just astonished that I just couldn't find more. I thought I'd just go to the library and got a lesson. And he said, well, until very recently, there was a stigma against putting anything in the news about women or children and crime because of the way women were thought of, and, which is you know not so good. But in this case, it worked to their advantage, I guess. Um, they, they wouldn't really get in the news unless the, the crime was so notorious that it couldn't be overlooked. So I said, thank you very much. I went back to the library and I found a book called uh, The True Story of Boxcar Bertha as Told to Dr. Ben L. Reitman. And it was a story about a woman who was a hobo in the 30s. And she, um, you know, had some intellectual and artistic background, some bit. But basically, she was just a hobo and went from one place to the other by jumping on a boxcar when she felt like it. She had a lover who was an IWW worker. Uh, she actually end up, ended up doing social work in Chicago uh, before somehow she made her way to San Francisco. And when I tracked her down, that's where she was living as a complete recluse. And um, I thought that the section of her story about not being restricted by any of the kind of things that we had just come out of, like white gloves and hats and so on, um, was a very interesting story to tell. That it was better, I thought, to come at the idea of women's liberation and their, their position and why they were not treated equally with men, to come at it in this kind of askew way. So that's what I found very interesting about the project. Um, so the writer came in Bill Corrington, he was quite a character, a southern fellow, um, philosopher, and he uh, started working on the project and then brought his wife in to write with him, Joyce Corrington. And we ended up in a story conference in which Bill said, you know, we should really change the title of this to Big Bill Shelley so that I could base it more on my grandfather who was an IWW worker. Well, showing my great maturity and how I really in charge of everything I was, I burst into tears and left the room. So Roger came out and said, what is the matter? And I said, 
He wants to ruin it. He wants to make it the story of Big Bill Shelley instead of Boxcar Bertha. And Roger said, well, that's not going to happen. And I said, well, why not? He's the writer. And he said, because AIP wants a woman gangster movie. So if you start with distribution, you have certain pieces you need to fill in. So I was much relieved by that. And then um, Marty Scorsese came in. And this is where I got a real um, eye-opening experience. Probably the most eye-opening experience of my life as, as a filmmaker. Uh, and Marty had some idea about the project also that had to do with his relationship with his brother, I believe. And once again, I thought, oh no, this is going to go all wrong. My project, my story about this woman who lived outside the system. And then David Carradine and Barbara Hershey came in. And um, Roger thought that Barbara Hershey was a little overweight. And he told her agent that she should drop a few pounds before we started shooting, not knowing that she was pregnant with David's child. So Barbara and David now brought their own dynamic to the project, and I could see right before my eyes that I had really lost control. I didn't know how much I'd lost control until we got to Camden, Arkansas, where the picture was to be shot. Marty had been there for a few weeks before in pre-production and preparing, and we walked into his motel room in Camden, Arkansas. Walls. was the entire film sketched. Every single shot of the picture sketched by Marty. And there it was. And we ended up with a Marty Scorsese film, Boxcar Bertha. So. And how was that character perceived by the audience? Oh, by the audience. Well, I'm not sure about the audience, but for me, Marty did so much more with my idea than I ever could have done that I was just astonished and thrilled. and. I mean, to this day, I'm really in awe of Marty's abilities as, as a filmmaker, and he is the total filmmaker. And while I'm not a huge fan of the possessory credit, I think in Marty's case, <laughs> there's no other way. You know, he's seen more films than anybody, so he comes at it from film history. He has memorized sh so many shots of sh so many scenes and how they go together, and then he uses them, and he you know, reuses them in, in con interconnected ways that you don't even, you're not even aware of as you're looking at the film. And then if it gets dissected for you by, by Marty or by, you know, a film critic who's very aware of all of this, you're just kind of astonished again. Um, and of course, as an editor, even though he had an editor, he worked with, you know, over time, Thelma Schumacher, who was just, you know, kind of amazing. It was still Marty who shot the picture. It was still Marty saying, you know, this is what I want to do. And so I always thought that he was the real force behind the editing of any of his pictures. And it didn't stop there. I mean, anything that affected his picture, he was not happy to turn it over to somebody else. The music, Boscar Bertha, what was the music? From the get-go, he was listening to Delta Blues and he was, yeah. Did you ever keep in contact with the real life Bertha? She no, she was very reclusive. She never would speak to me. We we tracked her down and we got her to sign um, a release and paid some money uh, to her. The public, the Ben L. Reitman was dead. The publisher had gone out of business. There was just tracking this woman down was extremely difficult. And I actually did it through. There's a kind of hobo conventions. They're kind of, you know, a little sub rosa. Uh, and read somebody there who said, "Yeah, I know where she's where she is." And so. And do you know why she was so reclusive? Because it sounds like her life had been about total freedom. And why would she I know. go the opposite way? I don't know. I was never able to find out. I'm wondering, do you think that a director should edit their own film, or are they too close to it? Is it is it too oh. too emotional for them to to really? Some people say that's where you have the ultimate control. Is in that editing. It's true. And, and, it's true. Well, I think I think by the time a director has directed a film, the director is closer to it than anyone else. And also because the director shot the film, the director, you know, framed scene by scene the film that in general, if an editor comes in and tries to do something other than what was in the mind of the director, it's a little like something that got created by committee. 
Um, but mostly, you know, we have an editor working while the director is shooting. And, you know, and there is an editor other than the director, mostly. Um, and so that by the time the film is finished shooting and shortly thereafter, there is a cut of the film that we can kind of look at and see, you know, did the movie get shot? Did we, is there something, some glaring, something glaring that's missing that we maybe didn't even think about while the script was being developed or, or while the, you know, while we were in pre-production or production, or sometimes the reverse, we see things that are really not needed. And it's really sad because you went to all the expense and all the trouble of shooting things and they just, they don't move the story forward for some reason. Um, so I think it's certainly important for the director to be in the editing room. I think that the, the, the editor during the shoot edits according to what the director's notes are and the script notes. Uh, so yeah, I, I think in a way the director is always a kind of an editor. But it seems like the female directors are still, there's a hindrance there. And that whole sort of percentage of women moving up in their careers has not followed with directing. Maybe so, more so with documentaries, mm -hmm. not narratives? What's your take I, well, I think it, it's surprising to me that it's, um, there, there are more women producers than directors. And in fact, the percentage of women directors, even in the Directors Guild, is appallingly low. Um, but I think Catherine Bigelow might have helped to to change that somewhat. And I think in television, there's a, a difference. Um, and it just is a little perplexing to me why, why women rose as producers of film more than directors. I would have thought it would be the other way. I don't know. Well, do you think in some sense, and, and this is going to sound strange, but it's more of a pink collar type of a thing, producer. You're handling more details that might be similar to a secretarial task. No. Whereas, no, you don't think so. Whereas no. behind the camera, and, and that's more... Well, I think the cult of the director has, has risen since the 60s, and that the studios were complicit in it, were, you know, part of it. So, I mean, it went as it went. And... Uh, you know, because prior to the 60s, it was really the producers. I mean, in a lot of films, you don't really remember who the director was. I think people don't really know the director of Gone with the Wind, for example. They think of the producer. Or you think of a Samuel L. Goldwyn or of, you know. Uh, so, um, anyway, thing, things have changed in terms of, and, and uh, I don't know, I suppose for the better because it has put more into the hands of the more the more creative the director's you know decisions but the producer's decisions are creative too the the producer can you know be deciding the location the cast the crew so at the end of the day the director now gets credit for all of that when it may well be the producer who put it all together so i don't know how do you think things will change or maybe they won't is this always going to be more of an exclusive boys club or do you think that down the line, as, as just gender roles have changed, I mean, men are taking you know, jobs as, as stewards on airplanes and out of necessity, right. just the economy turning, and you know, men are staying home with the children while women... Uh, yeah. you know, well, I don't know how it will be in the future, but as, mother, as a mother of two daughters, I would say it has not changed fast enough. Right. So, Anything to fight those gender stereotypes that you can... Think of, suppose you're on a set and you're asked to go get people coffee and I know you've said that no one really has a role that's just exclusively theirs and everybody pitches in, um, but are there ways to nicely, or maybe not so nicely, fight those stereotypes? Well, I think in a way that, you know, society kind of gives women um, somehow creates an aura in which they don't really know how to propel themselves and they're not as encouraged to do it as men are. I think men are, you know, as boys, also I'm the mother of two boys, and the boys are kind of encouraged to, you know, to, to win and to, uh, you know, to take charge and to 
uh, so in, in ways that girls are not. And some, I'm racking my brain to think of s subtler examples, but which I can't, but you know, we've all kind of experienced. Look, when I got married, um, my husband started using my credit card. So I called the credit card company and said I'd like to increase the amount that I could, you know, spend every month because I'm married now and my husband's using the card. And they said, oh, you're married? Oh, well, you can't have a credit card in your own name then. It has to be in your husband's name. Now, that was just something that everybody accepted because that was just how it was. I didn't accept it. I was just maybe a little feistier than the rest. And I said, well, if I don't have a credit card, then I'm not going to pay your bill. So please come after me because I'd just like to see what happens. And eventually I never paid the bill. And they would, people would call and say, you need to pay the bill. And I'd say, no, I'd like to go to court. Please sue me. And then that never happened. And then eventually they called every six months. And then within a few years, the law changed. But when you think about it, it was completely wrong. And that's, you know, that's in my lifetime. So anyway, that's gone. Uh, I do think that women need to be encouraged more to put themselves forward and to toot their own horns and to, you know, go after what they want and not think, oh, I won't be able to do it. But it's a little daunting to come into a male-dominated arena and say, you know, my turn. Uh, but that's what has to be done. So I'm going to tell you my story about something that I did. Okay, so um, so Roger was invited to Dallas, Texas, to get a drive-in movie award, which was a hubcap, and um, this was in the nineteen nineteen maybe around nineteen eighty. Anyway, so Roger was invited to get this award. And word came through the secretary of the director of the festival, the Drive-In Film Festival in Dallas, that shopping trips had been planned for Mrs. Corman. Now, I think at a previous time, and this is why I say that it, it has to do with how the woman reacts as much as how society is. So that was a common way of society looking at Mrs. Corman, right? Shopping trips. But by that time I think I'd produced about 10 or 12 films and I had a certain amount of confidence and instead of being offended or withdrawing or saying oh thank you very much and going shopping I said well that's very kind of them but would you please send word back from Mrs. Corman that Mrs. Corman is more interested in co-production deals. Well Dallas opened up with people who were interested in co-production deals and I ended up making two films there. The Dirt Bike Kid, and oh, actually I'm getting the financing in that direction from DA, uh, for DA, which I made in Ireland, but with Film Dallas Pictures financing. So I think it's, it's important to um, ask for what you want, because otherwise you're not going to get it. I like that. Is there a certain way to ask for it? <laughs> well, I don't know. That was the way I asked for it, and that's what happened. So instead of being mad about it, it was just a very right. gracious, you know, no thank you, and then put out what you did want. And all I didn't that. say no. I oh, said I more interested in co-production deals see. than shopping trips. Right, right. But thank you very much. Well, we've been told before that Hollywood respects male-female creative partnerships, and from a few people that we've talked to, they always say, you know, some of their tips are, don't make one person the disciplinarian of the group. But what would you recommend to people on terms of choosing a creative partnership? I'm not so sure that I think of what Roger and I do as a partnership. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I suppose people from the outside would look at it and say that it is. But I, I think Roger is so sui generis in what he does. He's like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of films and I kind of one at a time and, and so on. And we mostly don't work on the same projects. Uh, but in terms of what we do in business, you know, we own the business together. Uh, there is a distribution company. There, 
uh, you know, there are common things that we need to decide about an approach um, having to do with how much of our money are we going to spend on a film and, you know, what entity will it come from and so on. Um, or discussion back and forth about what do you think about this actor or what do you think about that director or can you recommend someone who'd work for you or, you know, we really need a key grip. What it, This kind of thing goes on on a daily basis. Um, I don't think we've ever had a serious disagreement about anything to do with whatever we do in business together. Even on Boxcar Bertha, <laughs> we both agreed it would not change to be about Big Bill Shelley. Um, so I don't, I, I don't really know how to answer you about what can someone do because it just, it works okay. All of that works okay. If anything, there's a kind of question of, you know, one wishing the other would take more charge of legal and accounting because neither of us really wants to do that. Um, so... I don't know. I, I just don't remember having a serious disagreement about anything to do with business. But I also know that in our marriage, um, what they say one of the big tests is if you build a house. And we built two houses. And I think what actually happened, which maybe is what happens uh, on the business end of this, is that we each had a couple of specific things that were very important to us to have in the house. The location of the dining room and the location of the bedroom. The size of the living room. And we both wanted the opposite thing. And we just traded. And I got the dining room where I wanted it and he got the big living room. And that was the end of it and we never really had a discussion about it again. Um, and the same thing happened with the second house. So I think maybe that kind of thing is happening on a regular basis with us in business, which is kind of thinking about, well, what's important to the other person and letting it go mm -hmm. and making a stand and having that be heard. And if you were to start over today in 2013, would you release your films via YouTube? Because some of the distribution deals that, you know, I've read about that, that you got for some of your films, I mean, it was just amazing. You could do them on such a low budget and then turn around, but it really doesn't seem to exist anymore. It was the Wild West, and we're, we're hoping, for, I mean, for us, the internet hasn't moved fast enough to get, you know, to get where it's going in terms of how can you get revenue uh, in order to get the financing for the films that you want to make. Would you consider YouTube at all? Of course. Mm -hmm. What do you see in YouTube? That so, there's some people that say, oh, it'll never, it'll never stick around, there'll be so many copyright infringement. Right. Yeah, I well, I think it's a I think it's a beginning, and I think then they'll figure it out. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of like how the studios figured out about. Eventually, their contract said that that you know originally they would say you know for the for the U.S. and Canada, the rights for the U.S. and Canada, and then eventually it said for the universe entire in every medium now known or able to be known by the mind of man, you know, <laughs> for eternity. Oh, okay, thank you. Except uh, Pluto. <laughs> oh, right, maybe. But yeah, because it doesn't, isn't really a planet anymore. Right. But I, uh, but I think that YouTube and some of these other, um, you know, online uh, approaches are, they're, they're going to figure it out. And we'll be there. <laughs> Ready to make films. <laughs>